Ella Roberta is my daughter. She was my eldest. She suddenly became ill with life-threatening asthma three months before her seventh birthday. She was ill for 28 months without the illegal levels of air pollution all around Lewisham. Not only would Ella not have got ill in the first place, she wouldn't have died 10 years ago. She remains the only person in the world to have air pollution on her death certificate. Ella's law was written in response to the government and their non-action over PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is particular matter. It's the worst pollutant which impacts human health. And the earliest the government is going to do something about it is 2040. So a child born today is not going to breathe clean air until they're 17. In London, a quarter of a million children have asthma and children continue to die. The only time in this country that no child has died from asthma is during the first lockdown. There were no cars on the road. But the moment the economy was reopened again, a child died the following month. It is our right to breathe clean air and it is government's duty to clean up the air. What Ella's law will entail is that the UK targets are in line with WHO targets. Currently they are not. This isn't a party political issue. We all have stake in this. It's about our health. It's about our future. We got 10,000 signatures in nine days. This tells me the British public are concerned about the air. It's 10 years since Ella dies. It would be a great way to honor her memory. So if she can be a part of making sure that nobody else goes through this, then I think she would like that, and she would like this to be a way to be remembered. Please welcome to the stage, Rosamund Adu Kissy Deborah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here with us. So let's start from the beginning. There's plenty of people here who maybe aren't from the UK who maybe won't be familiar with your, your, your story. So Ella was born in Lewisham, South London, um, That's correct. 2004. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what were the first signs that she had developed a health condition? Yeah, um, I think it's very important that I reiterate this because so many people have asked me many times. Um, Ella went to 41 weeks, healthy, eight pound baby, no respiratory issues. Um, and the thing to say to the audience who are very health conscious is, apart from her humanizations, um, <laughs> we were not known to the medical profession. So that's the only way to show you just how well she was. Ella wasn't a sickly child, you, you know, children who you get who are in and out of hospital all the time. Um, so th the first time we actually really went to hospital was in 2010 when sh she developed um, a severe um, a severe cough and it was di it was th the diagnosis is coughing syncope. So those of you who know what coughing syncope is will know how severe her, her, her cough was. So yeah, people sort of doubt that. And some people think, oh, she was definitely born with that. Absolutely not. And I can reassure you that if you look at her GP records and you ask someone, well, you know, where do you think this child is? A lot of people will think she's running around now and she's extremely healthy. So there was nothing there to, for us to be concerned about. So as far as you were concerned at that time, there wasn't kind of like clarity on why the condition had, had developed. She was a perfectly healthy child who just developed symptoms that... It, it was hard to determine what the, uh, the cause of them were. Yeah, actually, when you look at her medical notes, um, they struggle to diagnose her. So she was initially, she was tested. Um, so she has what we now know is hypoxic seizures, and a lot of you will know what that is. But initially she was tested for epilepsy, cystic fibrosis. I know it's a long shot, but they didn't really know what was wrong. She didn't present herself as a normal asthmatic. Um, one thing to tell you is she had one of the worst cases ever 
of asthma recorded. So it's very important to say that Ella didn't have mild asthma. She had life-threatening or brittle asthma, you, you could say. And also her, con her condition was extremely rare. And I, I have this little story to tell the audience, actually. She was having a, a bronchoscopy, I think in 2012, at King's College Hospital. And while she was obviously um, down there, you, you know how you look at uh, medical, well, I, I did, looked at medical journals and I was reading at coughing syncope. And one of the things I noticed at that time, coughing syncope was, it was more in long distance lorry drivers. And I was thinking, mm, we kind of live in Lewisham. Well, what has she got in common with you know, long distance lorry drivers. And there, were, there was no other child really in all the literature at the time that had coughing syncope. I don't know whether there is now because I actually haven't looked at it. So I can remember when Dr. Ruiz came up um, because Ella's lungs, um, he, he wanted to do the um, bronchoscopy in a day centre. And I was like, hell no, because he didn't really know her. And I knew how unpredictable my daughter could be. So this was meant to be a straightforward bronchoscopy. And he was down there for quite a while. So he came up and he was literally, and by the way, Dr. Ruiz, is, he was the head of um, children. So he was very senior. So I can remember he came up and he was, you know, all his face was literally red and I was like, what happened and he was like going your daughter so they've done the you know they've done the procedure everything went well and suddenly her lungs began to shut down and to say he was panicked is putting it mildly so ella could be very well at times and she'll be running around being okay as you saw her skipping that was sports day the year before she passed away and then then other times she was close to death. She was in ICU, I think, five times altogether. And I think we were lucky she, she, she survived. But the doctors did, did warn me, the more she comes in, this, this is not great. You know, we can get her better, but yeah, I can see a few people nodding. Um, they did warn me, but you kind of live in hope, don't you? So sadly, Ella passed away two weeks after her ninth birthday, 2013. Three weeks. Three weeks. Um, what was the process by which you began to make the link between her death and air pollution? Can you just talk us through Oh, that, that was absolutely not until after she um, died. So the first time I got a clue, actually, was a coroner's officer um, who was looking into her case and preparing it for the first inquest. And I remember um, I had to go up there and have a conversation with her. And she sort of said to me, oh, Rosamond, you know, this case looks really complicated. Sorry it's taking so long. We needed a real expert who had medical knowledge to sit in on the case. And the, um, it was the same coroner, by the way, who sat on the second inquest. It was something that I, in, that I insisted on, actually, because at the first inquest, he showed me he had taken his time to really look at the um, details. But I, I remember the coroner, coroner's officer saying to me, what you're probably looking for, you're not gonna get it at this inquest. And those of you who've been involved in inquests, you know what it's about, who the person is, was everything done right on the night, which is just basic things really. But the one thing I did, and I won't be able to explain why I did it, it's just something I did. I made sure they took samples from all over her body. Don't ask me now, I was in the process of grief, but I made sure they actually did that um, before she was buried and the samples are still kept, kept at Great, Great Ormond Street. Um, and in court the first time, it was the first time it was established that some of it might be due to something in the air. And I'm not going to sit here now and say to you, I thought it was air pollution because at the child death review, they sort of left it open. And I can re remember the doctors there were saying, you know, you've been through such an awful experience. You really need to move on. Something in the air could be anything. You know, what does something in the air mean? That could be anything. And I remember the anniversary of her, of her death. Um, I did, um, I gave an interview to a, a, a local newspaper and I, I was just asking out there that, you know, this is my daughter, this is what happened to her and does anyone, can, can anyone out there help me? And I remember, I got all sorts of emails, by the way, from people saying it's probably dairy, you know, the kind of usual sort of stuff. But there was one guy who wrote to me and said to me, you need to check the air pollution 
uh, round your house around the time and, and they passed away. And you know you get what, those geeky people that monitor those things. And, <laughs> sorry, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Only by the way you reacted. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. To, and, um, and, and, and basically, to cut a long story short, her lawyer, Jocelyn Coburn, um, she was looking for people who had been impacted by air pollution. And I can remember going into her office and saying to her, I think I might have something for you. I don't know, but this is what I have been told. And that's how um, it started. And I, I, I will always give credit to Jocelyn. So what she did basically, I mean, it's such a genius thing she did now when I think about it, but very simple. She basically outlined on a graph all the times Zella had been admitted to hospital, so just before she went in, and then she got the data from the monitors near the house. And you could always see just before there was a spike in air pollution, Ella would go down. And we, we then found out that happened 27 out of 28 times. As far as I'm concerned, that's scientifically significant. There was one anonymously there, which is, yeah. yeah. So that's how the whole thing started. But what we needed was an expert. There was no point having that graph in courts because that would be challenged. And I think our biggest effort was to find people who would support the evidence which we, um, which we knew, knew about and come forward. I hope some of you here know Sir Stephen Holgate. Um, he was the expert witness which we used in um, Ella's inquest, but it was incredibly difficult to find somebody who would stand up in court. I think, if I'm being nice and generous, it's not, a, probably from a scientific point of view, if you're going up against a government and that's who you rely on for your grants. Um, mm. Yeah, so I could see people just smiling and laughing, but that's the honest truth. We, we really struggled to get someone to come forward. But I suppose Stephen was retired. He had nothing to lose from that point of view. Yeah. So, yeah, and I owe him so much. Um, I mean, we still work together um, even, even now. So you got the, the, the death certificate changed? I did. And um, during the second inquest, 2020, you um, had what's known as a prevention of future death report mm -hmm, that's filed. Right. Can you just talk a little bit about the importance of that? Because that to me seems like a very sort of significant moment. Yeah, I have learned that it's not every inquest you actually get that. I now know now. And because um, the coroner felt that other children were at risk of dying, and he made that very, very clear actually, that unless the air was cleaned up, more children would die. And I don't think it's a secret. I mean, this is a health audience. People will know that our asthma death rate is one of the worst in Europe. So that's not um, a, a secret. But it wasn't just that. I mean, the reason why I went for Philip Barlow again, because people, people always ask me, why him? I just realised that the first inquest, we were, only in, we were in court for one day, but I could see this gentleman was taking his time. He was listening to the evidence. He took it very seriously. And those of you who haven't seen the prevention of future death, there were other, um, you know, other requirements which he made. One of them was monitoring that air pollution needs to be monitored and raising awareness amongst the public. That was also key. And the thing for anyone in health as well, uh, he made his recommendations very clear. So all the royal colleges, everyone is meant to be... Um, you know, there needs to be CPD about it. It doesn't matter what, what level you enter. And hopefully in future, medical students who want to be future doctors, they will change the course of medicine. So air pollution and the impact is something they learn. If you're someone who is a seasoned health professional, they wanted everybody to be educated in it. And I have to say, um, the health profession have been incredibly supportive. And also, to be fair, a lot of the research about the impact of air pollution and, and health has come out over the last 10 years. So people have become more educated. We now know air pollution impacts every organ in the body. We know it's linked to all the NCDs. Uh, God, when I say NCDs, I know this is a health audience. So everyone knows what I'm talking about, but I always have to mind. I think I, no, yeah. Please do explain it just for people who mm -hmm. might not know. Non communal disease, so like obesity, heart attacks. So for instance, every time there's a spike in air pollution, more people have heart attacks, more people have asthma attacks. They've now found PM 2.5 on the brain of dementia pa uh, patients. 
in the placenta of pregnant women. Um, so, yeah, it is a real health health concern. And I probably am predicting what you're going to ask me next, because people say, why is there such a battle to get it through with politicians? And I say to them, the politicians know probably even more than I do. Um, they get all the data, they get everything. So people will have to ask them why they don't take this matter s seriously. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the legislation. So Clean Air Bill introduced, passed the House of Lords. Ella's law is now being deliberated by MPs and House Commons. Um, hasn't yet passed through the final stage, is my understanding. Um, can you just give us a sense What's in that bill? Like, what would it mean? What, it, what impact would it have? Well, it will enshrine our human rights. Oh, that, that, that word in itself, you know, <laughs> bothers some um, MPs. Um, I'm sure you know the politics being, being, being played out. Also, it sets a clear pathway for us to adopt WHO guidelines in 2021. Because the WHO guidelines, up until that point, they were 2005, which is really old. And I think WHO looked at it is they had these guidelines and still seven to nine million people were dying every year so they were not strong enough um, also as we all know during covid there was a, a lot more information that came came out about indoor air so one of the things we did in the bill we put indoor air as well so and by the way this was before sadly the young child died uh, of mold and everything so this is a growing concern and a lot of us in our everyday life will know about the, the dangers of indoor air. So we thought, although Ella didn't die from indoor, we thought we should add that to the, to the bill. So it deals with also both indoor and outdoor air. But I think we need a pathway. We need to get to WHO guidelines. And when people ask me, there is nowhere in the UK at the moment. Um, I'm v I, I sort of look upon it as suspicion when I hear politicians say our air is cleaner than before. Well, there is nowhere in the UK that is compliant with WHO guidelines, and that is the um, goal, because it shows if we comply with WHO guidelines, we will save the economy. Apparently, that's what politicians like to hear, the economy. Um, we will save 1.6 billion, and also uh, some of the illnesses. Obviously, we've all got to die, but people are are living longer with such awful illnesses now. And, uh, well, what I mean by that is, for example, when I was younger, one in nine of us got cancer. And I know people say, yeah, Ros, but there are other things like diet. But cleaning up the air can only be a good thing. L let's be honest about that. It can only be a good thing. I think the point you made about the politics of this is, is really important. Um, we've saw, you know, only recently sort of um, the uh, by-election uh, loss, Ulez is a big kind of a f for, for, the, for Labour. Ulez is very controversial. The Mayor of London has taken this on as a, as a significant issue. Um, the argument was that a lot of people um, can't afford to change their cars and this is disproportionately impacting people on lower incomes. What would you say to them? Yeah, I need to comment about that. Um, Ulez came up in Ella's inquest. And all the experts, all of them, no matter what side they were on. By the way, Ella's inquest was in 2020, so it was before the cost of living crisis. And we could see the difference it had made in inner London. And the recommendation was to expand it London-wide. And then before my very eyes. At that time, there was no debate. Everyone thought it, it was a good idea. But every time politics gets involved in things, the culture war, the things, the only thing I can say to you now is 97% of vehicles in London are, are compliant. So there's a 3% that I will continue to nag the, um, the Mayor of London, they need to do what they can to make sure other people are compliant. Yes, it's extremely difficult. Yes, we know there are people who have been severely impacted by that. Um, I am not a politician. I am only saying that, you know, 65% um, of air pollution is from him emissions, so we need to lower it. And it's up to the politicians to make sure that people are well compensated. Um, that is all I can say. That, you know, that's way above my actual uh, brief. But then it's not the only thing that contributes to air pollution. We have wood, wood burning, construction, dust. There are, there are other things. I just think that certain politicians feel this is just playing party politics with the whole thing. And the whole thing, war on drivers. And 
I just think it's just, it's just a smokescreen, really. They know it needs to be done. The coroner has said it needs to be done. And when you speak to them outside of, you know, where there's no cameras, they know the impact, the health impact of dirty air. And if we do manage to pass, or they do manage to pass Ella's law, do you think there's a clear pathway to hitting those WHO guidelines? Yes, but it, it is stored in the Commons. This is the second time round the bill's been introduced. On, on the 14th, it will have its second reading. And the only people you can really ask why they won't, because the government has a majority in, in the House currently, let, let's be honest. Um, I don't know whether it's about 70. Um, and they don't see it as a, a, a vote winner. I, I am afraid. Um, yeah, a few people are nodding. They don't. They don't see it as a vote winner. And to me, that is the only reason why. They know deep down in their little chambers that this is a good thing. They do. Trust me, they do. So, incredible campaign that you've, 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 you've waged. And I think that, you know, you've become a public figure in, in the UK. Like, how do you think about what's next? What would you like to, other than obviously the law becoming uh, uh, policy and, and, and be passed within the Commons? Like, what next for you? How do you, how do you want to build well, this campaign further? Hopefully there will be another meeting um, to talk about the prevention of future death. We've already had one with Sir, with Sir Chris Whitty. Recently, a lot of you would have seen that the Mayor of London put um, filtration in 200 schools. Of course, quietly, I was behind that one to push it to where, where I can. Um, but, you know, Sir Chris, Sir Chris Whitty felt we have focused quite a lot on outdoor air, quite rightly. And going forward, we do need to look at in, indoor air. So that's something I will just continue. And there's um, a mayor election coming up. There's a general election coming up. And I'm just going to continue to highlight that air pollution is something that we need to take. Is that me? that we need to take seriously. And I, I would like everyone in health to make their voices felt loud and clear. I think the general public, lis listen to doctors, medics, people from health, and if you all say, this is what needs to happen, just ignore the politics, that would help me in my campaigning. Well, Rosamond, thank you so much for coming today and sharing Ella's story. Uh, it was wonderful to hear you talk, and it's wonderful to hear about your campaign. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.